Hi everyone, this is Zhi Zhang from Wisconsin Medicine. Welcome to my talk. In this talk, I will present our work beyond fraud detection, combating fraudulent online survey takers. This is joint work with collaborators from Penn State and Illinois. Online surveys are widely used by researchers to understand humans' attitudes and behaviors. They can help quickly access a large number of qualified participants and gain useful results. However, online surveys can be attacked by malicious people and bots and overwhelmed by fraudulent responses, causing wasted compensation, corrupted data, and distorted conclusions. Existing techniques against fraudulent responses can be divided into upfront tests and post hoc tests. Upfront tests prevent submissions from automated bots or malicious people. For example, Captures can prevent bots from accessing online surveys, and we can disable submissions from VPNs or IP addresses with bad history. post hoc tests aim to filter out redundant submissions and low-quality submissions. For example, knowledge chat tests can filter out responses from ineligible participants. However, do the existing techniques still work? First, bots are increasingly sophisticated. Using deep learning models, bots may solve difficult captures and even answer text questions. What's more, human behaviors are dynamically changing. With increasing privacy awareness, legitimate participants may use private browsing and VPNs, which can harm the effectiveness of IP-based techniques. Therefore, it is important to evaluate the existing anti-fraud tests. In this work, we designed 22 individual tests for fraudulent responses based on technical, psychological, and domain knowledge methods. We conduct two surveys on Qualtrics to evaluate the results. For the Rust survey, we recruit participants with Rust knowledge from public forums. We compute precision and recall for each individual test and also evaluate several ensemble tests. We examine the collected behavioral data to figure out the nature of the respondents' activities. The MTurk survey targets general internet users without any domain knowledge. It is designed to validate the findings of the Rust survey. We find that the domain knowledge tests are the most effective, and fraudulent respondents involve both bots and human features. In total, we have 10 findings about anti-fraud tests. The findings can benefit future survey designers and survey data analyzers. Moreover, we conduct head-to-head -head comparisons on respondents' height through two recruiting methods and demonstrate their characteristics. This is the outline of my talk. I finished the introduction. Next, let me introduce our methodology. We designed two surveys for our study. The Rust survey aims to understand Rust programmers' programming challenges. We post recruiting advertisements on online forums, including Reddit, Twitter, and Rust forums. The MTurk survey is to understand how users perceive fake social network profiles. We recruit participants on Amazon MTurk. We do not require any expertise for the participants. We designed 22 individual anti-fraud tests. Each labels a survey response as either valid or invalid. Those tests depend on the information provided by Quadrix, designed survey questions, or embedded JavaScript. Moreover, we construct six ensemble tests by combining individual tests. Due to the limited time, I will only discuss some tests here. Please refer to our paper for more details. We designed five tests to detect duplicate responses from the same participant, since malicious Participants may take the survey multiple times for compensation. The five test checks UIDs in the survey URLs. 
allocated cookies, IPs recorded by Quartrix, browser fingerprints computed by JavaScript, and duplication scores reported by relevant ID. We construct three tests to detect automated behaviors and pinpoint possible survey bots. One test requires participants to wait for five seconds and then click a pop-up button to continue. The second test is a recapture test. We record participants' screen resolutions. The third test detects a response as invalid if its resolution contains an OR number. We design two tests to detect responses from inattentive participants. The first one asks which industry a participant is in and then explicitly instructs the participant to ignore the question and choose the italicized option. The second test asks for participants' occupations in two questions with slightly different wordings. The two questions are in different survey stages. Domain knowledge can be used to filter out responses from ineligible participants. We design three tests based on the knowledge of Rust. Test 20 and 21 ask for the output of a Rust program. Test 22 asks participants which Rust grammar is violated. This question can only be answered with certain Rust knowledge. Moreover, we further compare valid and invalid responses onto cognitive performance measures, response time, and rating scale responses. To decide ground truth labels, we solely rely on open-ended question answers without referring to the previously discussed anti-fraud test. We define a response as invalid if it does not provide meaningful information in its answer to an open-ended question or does not show a new attempt to do so. For example, if an answer is too short or is copied from external sources on the internet, we consider the response is invalid. In other words, a valid response may give an imperfect answer, but we expect that the answer demonstrates certain efforts of the participant. In total, there are 50 valid responses in the Rust survey and 46 valid responses in the MTurk survey. Next, I will show you the evaluation results of the Rust survey. We count a response as true positive for a test if the test detects the response as invalid and we also label the response as invalid based on open-ended question answers. We then count and compute other metrics accordingly. We have five tests aiming to capture duplicate submissions. This figure shows their results. Y-axis represent the computed precision or record values. Blue bars are the precisions and orange bars are the records. Moreover, we label each blue bar with the raw data used to compute the precision by putting the TP number over the sum of the TP and FP numbers. As shown in the figure, four tests do not have any false positive. Browser fingerprint helps detect the most invalid responses. Thus, malicious participants are less likely to hide their browser fingerprints. We have three tests to capture or block automated bots. The test detecting on Euro screen resolutions can capture 82 responses and report zero false positive. Unfortunately, the recapture test and the test requiring participants to wait for five seconds block very few uh, invalid submissions, indicating that invalid responses are likely to contain human interventions. We have an attention check and consistency check for the psychology test. Both of them detect more than 100 and, uh, invalid responses. However, both of them also report false positives, showing that participants who spend enough efforts on answering open-ended questions 
can still make mistakes when answering attention checks or consistency checks. We have three tests designed based on Ross Nori. They detect 161, 195, and 206 invalid responses, respectively. The different TP numbers are consistent with the dif dif uh, different difficulty levels. All the three tests report very few false positives. Overall, domain knowledge is effective in detecting fraudulent responses. Let me show you the result of cognitive performance measures. We first com compare how much time valid participants and invalid participants spend on the whole survey and each survey phase. Overall, valid participants use a significantly longer time to finish the whole survey than invalid participants. Moreover, valid participants spend a significantly longer time on the phase where we ask technical Ross questions, probably because the technical questions are difficult and valid participants need time to think. We also inspect how response time distributes. In this figure, x-axis represents time spent on the whole survey, y-axis represents on the proportion of participants. We use blue bars to denote valid participants and orange bars to represent invalid participants. The distribution of valid participants is skewed to the right. However, the distribution of invalid participants is by model, suggesting a possible combination of two different participant groups with two different automation levels. The response time distribution can help differentiate valid respondents from invalid response. We have two contrasting scale rating questions. One asks participants how successful they feel when evaluating a compiler error message. The other asks them how frustrated they feel when evaluating the same message. Both questions ask participants to read their feelings using a number from 1 to 21. We compare the distribution of valid participants' choices with the distribution of invalid participants. This figure shows the distribution on the successful question. X-axis represents the 21 possible choices. Y-axis represents the participant's proportion. Similar to all previous figures, we use blue bars to denote valid participants and red bars to denote invalid participants. The right figure shows the distribution on the frustrated question. For valid participants, the choices has opposite patterns on the two figures, revealing an implicit consistency. However, invalid participants' choices show central tendencies on the two figures, which can potentially help separate uh, invalid responses from valid ones. Now, let me quickly discuss the results of the MTurk survey. This table shows the highlighted results and the comparison with the Ross survey. Please refer to our paper for more details. Compared with the Ross survey, two duplication-based tests become less effective. This is because there's no incentive to take the MTurk survey twice, as participants only get paid once by MTurk. Automation-based tests are less effective. All MTurk workers need to verify their emails and credit cards to register accounts at MTurk. It's costly to manage a large number of bots on MTurk. It is less likely to encounter bot participation on MTurk, and thus duplication and automation-based tests are less effective. The VPN test detects a large number of invalid responses. The MTurk survey is restricted to US. We observe that some participants use VPNs to bypass MTurk's location restrictions. Different from other duplication-based tests, the browser fingerprint test is still effective. It detects cases where multiple and third accounts are managed by the same person. In conclusion, we systematically evaluate the effectiveness of 22 tests 
in preventing and detecting fraudulent responses across two different online surveys. In total, we have 10 findings. As future work, we plan to design robust tests against future fraudulent entities. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Um, we still have a couple of minutes left for questions. So if there's anyone from the audience um, who wants to ask a question, uh, please feel free to unmute. Yeah, I have a question. So how can you know afterwards, so you can know that um, this is actually a false negative or it is a true negative? If, if, your, if your test isn't catch, it's catch it out. Well, uh, it's a good question. So basically we rely on the open, solely rely on the open-ended questions to label the response as valid or invalid. Yeah, so, so if a test, uh, if the test predicts the response as invalid and uh, we also label the response as invalid, then it is a true positive. Yeah, I don't know whether this answers your question. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, th thanks for the presentation. So um, out of the tests that you've presented, which of them do you think are the easiest to integrate into a, a survey? If I'm designing a new survey, which ones are, are the easiest for me to put in? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So. Uh, basically, according to our results, uh, if the survey uh, requires domain knowledge, then uh, embedding a couple of domain knowledge checks uh, is a good idea because it's uh, kind of very effective. And uh, also uh, something like uh, automation and duplication detection are also effective. But uh, the point is that uh, only uh, have one like recapture uh, test is, is not a good idea because it's not enough to defend the survey and uh, most uh, boss or malicious people can bypass that. And uh, also uh, have multiple tests, uh, you know, a combination of tests is, uh, can greatly in improve the performance of the detection. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have another question. So if I, um, if I uh, submit a form or survey about the Rust and then I submit another survey about the Rust, but I answer different, different answer in the open end question and both answer is valid. Can you detect that I duplicate, I submit double time? Well, uh, it's a good question. So. So uh, we, we solely rely on open-ended question uh, answer labeling because we want to separate the labeling from the, uh, from the anti fraud test results so we can uh, evaluate those results. And the open-ended questions uh, answers are regarded as one of the most effective ways. But for your, for your uh, scenario, of course, in our survey, uh, we can't detect that. Um, so, so, uh, if in, uh, so if it is in an actual practical uh, survey, we expect that we combine multiple tests, including uh, duplication-based tests, as we mentioned in the survey, and uh, yeah, uh, combine multiple tests to detect the fraudulent responses. I see, thank you.